Back on show 851, we talked about ignoring some of podcasting's best practices. And today, we're talking to Gary Arndt, and he, by design, does a show that's about everything. He's also closing in on getting 1 million downloads a month. It's so clear and straightforward. I just, I don't get why everybody isn't doing it. What's he talking about? You'll find out today. Hit it, ladies. The School of Podcasting with Dave Jackson. Podcasting Sense 2005. I am your award-winning Hall of Fame podcast coach, Dave Jackson, thanking you so much for tuning in. If you're new to the show, this is where we help you plan, launch, and grow your podcast. And today, we're going to be talking with Gary Arndt from Everything Everywhere. So we're going to be talking a little podcast monetization as well. My website is schoolofpodcasting.com. If you go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash listener, that will apply a coupon for you so that when you sign up for either a monthly or yearly subscription, you'll save a little and you can join worry-free with that 30-day money-back guarantee. And I always like to start off with either a quick tip or because of my podcast story. And so here is today's quick tip. I'm seeing a trend when you sign up for whatever media host you use, whether that's Libsyn, Buzzsprout, Captivate, Blueberry, whoever, there is a slot when you make an episode where you can put a link to where people can get more information. And I see so many people leave the link that goes to whoever your media host is. So for this example, I'm going to say Libsyn. And so you leave it set to blog page, which goes to Libsyn's blog, right? You have your own little Libsyn page. And yet all of the magic happens on your website where you have your newsletter sign up and maybe they're going to buy your book or attend a webinar or whatever it is. Join your mastermind. All your products and services are on your website. So what you want to do is treat every episode like a blog post on your website. So all the show description that you type in to your media host, copy and paste that into a blog post and then copy and paste the player as well. Now, what this does is if people listen on your website, they will spend more time on your website, which may increase your Google traffic. Likewise, if other people go, wow, that was really good, and they send their friends to your website, that again will potentially increase your Google traffic. It's just one of those things that I I think people think, oh, I have to use the website from my media host. And I'm here to tell you, no, that's there for places like schools that don't have a website and, you know, Mrs. Smith just needs it for a third grade because she's teaching podcasting. So if you have a website, go into whoever your media host is, make sure that under your information for your podcast, you're pointed at your website and the episodes, in my opinion, should be pointing back to your website where you have the same information. Likewise, those words on your page are going to also attract Google So it's just a quick tip that I start to see more people just pointing at the media host. And I'm like, that's, you're kind of missing the boat when you have your own website. Now, if you need a domain name, you can get those from coolerwebsites.com or Namecheap. If you need a website for your podcast, I actually teach people how to build one. Go to learnpodpage.com and you can actually build a website using a tool called PodPage, but you're missing out some traffic. You're hindering your Google juice. And I just wanted to pass that along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before Gary was a podcaster in North America, Gary was voted travel photographer of the year three times. You can check out all his photography at everything-everywhere.com. He spent a decade on the road just going round and round and round to all different parts on the globe. And the number of followers he had on social media was in the six figure range. And then the pandemic hit the travel industry was obliviated and Gary lost everything. What did he do? He decided to double down on his podcast and Gary was willing to come on the show and share his insights. You said, well, I'm going to double down on this whole podcast thing. And I think the first myth I want to bust here is, okay, so you had a really successful 
you know, website and you had all sorts of followers on social media. So it was just a piece of cake to start a podcast because they all just followed you over, right? No, they did not. We're going to hear how Gary creates his show and how he grew his audience right after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was just a piece of cake to start a podcast because they all just followed you over, right? No, they did not. <laughs> um, it, that's not how it worked uh, because for starters, a lot of those people were not following me for podcast reasons. They were following me to look at pretty pictures. And, yeah. and that's why they were there. And the other thing is social media doesn't convert that well for podcasting, which is kind of just a fact that I've heard other people say other big podcasters like uh, Jordan Harbinger. And I kind of figured this out myself. I eventually I was posting, you know, every show to Twitter and Facebook, and then I just stopped doing it and it did nothing to my to my downloads. <laughs> uh, and, and the reason I believe this is true is because when you're launching a show, by all means, talk about it on social media because you're letting the people who follow you know that you have the show. But once they know about it, they know about it and they have made their decision whether they are going to follow and listen to your show or not. And then all you're doing is annoying them by mentioning every single episode. The only place I have found any traction on social media is TikTok. And the reason is because TikTok will show your videos to people who don't follow you. So it allows you to expand it. But even then, conversion on TikTok is not great. I had a video the other day, like two days ago. So far, it's gotten over 30,000 views, which is pretty good for me. And that converted to maybe 30 clicks. I was going to say, because that's the thing is, is their algorithm will kind of poo-poo you if you put a link to something else. At least that's what I've been told. So the hardest part is, how do I get people off of TikTok? over to check out my podcast. How, how are you approaching that? I just have a link in my bio and I use a chartable link so I can track how many people click on it. So I have a separate chartable link for Twitter, Facebook, even Pinterest, everything. But TikTok by far gets more clicks, but it's still not a lot because I hear a lot of podcasting gurus that they social media, social media, got to have the, the clips and everything. And that really is of limited use. It really is not the way you grow a show. And if you look at what the big networks do, the Wonderies, the iHeart Podcasts, all them, that's not what they're relying on for building audiences. They're relying on promoting their shows through other podcasts. And I've seen many large independent podcasters say the same thing. And having done it myself, I can confirm that is really what works. Do you remember how many downloads you were getting when you first started out? The first month. So I started my show July 1st, 2020. Uh, and I picked that date just to make the accounting easy because it was the beginning of the third quarter. I got 6,200 downloads my first month. I am now getting a little under 30,000 downloads a day. Wow. I'm getting close to a million downloads a month. And total, I've had over 8 million downloads, I think. That, and that's how long has the show been now. going? Under two and a half years. Wow. That's impressive. A lot of work. It's a daily show. That's the other thing we should point out, but that's. It's a seven day a week show, not a five day a week show. And it's a scripted show. So I'm basically writing a 2000 word term paper every single day. And that's how I do the show. And the nice thing is the audience recognizes that it's a lot of work. So they, they tend to be a bit forgiving about things. Yeah. 2000 words is about what? 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, that's a, it's about the average length of a show, 10 minutes yeah, for me. When I was listening to it, I was like, this might be my new shower show because I need a show that's like around 10 minutes. I get a lot of people that say that, that I'm part of their morning routine. They wake up, they listen to it, they learn something new. And there was a lot of incidental things that I never planned on that came true. So I, one of my good college friends said, yeah, I, my, this is my daughter's favorite show. She's nine years old and she'll even mm -hmm. hum the theme song. And they listen on the, on their car on the way to school. And it's long enough where, where they could do that. And then I had people, homeschoolers writing me saying that we listen to your show. And then I had teachers in high schools telling me that they listen in class. And I made a decision early on that this was going to be a, uh, a clean show. I was, so I wasn't going to use any language. And I also wasn't going to talk about anything in current events because I, before I did the show, I went and I did an analysis of popular shows and I looked at what was the reasons people gave a one-star review? Two things that overwhelmingly jumped out. 
too many ads and inserting politics where it wasn't necessary. If you Mm -hmm. have a political show, by all means, be political. But when people throw in politics, then people, you know, you're going to tick off about half your audience. And so I, I safely stay several decades away. You know, I take more of an analytical look at it, and I never talk about current events. The closest I've really come is I will talk about things that are related to stuff in the news. So before the 2020 election, I did a series on past presidential elections that were close, and I let people connect the dots themselves. I'm just putting the information out there for them to figure it out. It's one of those things, like you said, you didn't plan on it. You weren't thinking of nine-year-old people when you started this. But if you mark one episode as explicit, not only do you turn off parents, but you also get pulled from a number of countries. You get pulled out of Apple Podcasts. I learned this lesson because I was a fan of a show that was a history podcast where the guys are extremely crude, like really crude. They're unapologetic about it. And eventually it got to the point where you could see in the reviews where it turned a lot of people off. I don't think anyone Mm -hmm. was listening to the show because they were that way. They couldn't get advertisers and they complain about not making money all the time. And then guess refused to appear on the show because they would listen to other shows. And I just couldn't think of any advantage to what they were doing. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll go the opposite way. You know, I, I like to say the show is as clean as history will allow. So it, it's a safe show to listen to for anyone. You can listen to it in front of your kids as a side effect. It's also, I think, safe for advertisers. You mentioned that social media will grow your show by a crawl. And you mentioned about appearing on other shows. How do you go about finding shows? Are you, are you being approached like I approached you, but are you also approaching other shows or is it primarily other people approaching you? Lately, it's been other people approaching me, but I think starting next year, I'll be more coordinated in my efforts to try to get on other shows simply because doing a daily show is, is very time consuming. So I don't have a whole lot of time for everything else. Yeah. But I have a general rule that I'd never say no to an interview request. How do you do a seven day show? Is there like, do you do two on Saturday or do you just never take a day off? Uh, when I, when I do take a day off, I'll use a rerun. I've done over 850 mm-hmm. episodes at this point. So I have plenty of back material that even if you, I, I, I started a thing on the show. Have you ever, do you remember the Saturday night live sketches where they would have the five timers club? Yes. Where, so I created a similar thing on the show called the completionist club. That if you've listened to every episode, you get the keys to the club and I've created different chapters in different countries. It was kind of a joke, but now people kind of take it seriously. And it's an incentive for people to listen to every single show. But even if you've listened to every show, there's a good chance you probably need to refresh something that, you know, those 500 shows ago. So I'll I'll do that maybe two to four times a month. Uh, I'll do a rerun. Uh, But other than that, like I have not written tomorrow's show and we are recording this at. 10, 15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah. And I have a really bizarre sleep schedule. I get up at like three in the afternoon and then I'll stay awake until the show is done and go to bed around six in the morning. I'm not proud of the fact. It's just sort of what happened. Yeah. Because it's a daily show. You got to get the show at the door. And that I think is really the most challenging thing is that it's like running a daily newspaper. If you've ever had a daily newspaper, you probably never recalled a day where the paper just didn't show up. There's a story. They have a deadline because the paper has to hit the presses. And if you miss that deadline, it has to go next day's show. But with a daily podcast, you've got to get it out the door. And so I don't put a ton of time and effort into recording or sound or things like that. I have a very simple, straightforward way of doing it. It takes very little time. Uh, the vast majority of my time is writing and research. Do you find that by writing a script, then there's less editing? Oh, absolutely. It, it is the a single person recording locally doing a scripted show is the easiest thing in the world to edit. In fact, whenever I hear you know podcasters talk about editing problems, it's always a person who's remote. They're doing an interview and there's ums and ahs you have to get rid of and, and sound quality of that. So by doing a, a scripted show, I eliminate most of it. I read the script until I get to a point where I screw up or I want to emphasize something differently. And then I just move the wave file back to the end of the last paragraph or sentence. And I start from there again. And by the time I'm done reading it, the show's done. That's, that's all the edits. And then I just, um, I record different blocks. So I'll record the intro separately, the body separately, and then an outro separately. 
And then I just put them all together like Legos and GarageBand, and that's it. <laughs> How do you figure out what, what the episode's going to be about? I keep a running list of ideas that's over 800 ideas long right now, but sometimes I'll just come up with something that I think is very interesting. Uh, so tomorrow's show is going to be a primer on population demographics, how it works, and how we know about you know world population trends and things like that. That idea just came to me the other day. I was watching something, and they said, oh, the eighth, eight billionth person was born, and doing a background on how we know this stuff and demographic trends I thought would be pretty useful. And a lot of those explainer videos have done pretty well. Sometimes I'll plan it out a couple of weeks in advance, but I always try to kind of keep it random. If I've done one on ancient history, then I'll think of something else. I'll do one on science or I'll do one on uh, a famous person, a biography, something else to keep it different. So I describe the show as like, you know, Forrest Gump's box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> And I think that that the random nature of that is one of the things people like. They they wake up every day and they don't know what's going to be waiting for them and what I'm going to be talking about. You know, you keep your show tight. There's no fluff. There's not a lot of talk about pancakes and kittens in your show. And because of that, if about halfway through the show, I go, yeah, you know what? I don't really care much about this topic. You're you're halfway done. It's going to wait another four minutes. It's going to be yeah. over. Based on the data from Apple and Spotify, I get very few people that abandon the show once they start. Yeah, I could see that. Now that you've got a, you've got your topic, how long do you think it takes to, to do all your research and, and get an episode out the door? It really depends. Some episodes are really easy for me to write, and it's just a matter of typing. If that's the case, I can do, I can write an episode in maybe two, two and a half hours. Sometimes it, it's, takes a lot more work and it may take like up to six hours just because there's a lot more specific data that I need to mention and it's just harder to do. So like tomorrow's episode that I'm doing on population demographics is going to be relatively easy. I have a good idea of the outline in my head uh, as to what I'm going to do. And so I just need to kind of do it. I did one last week on the use of horses in World War II. And that actually took a lot more time because I had to hunt down a lot of sources on the use of horses in World War II. Have you ever had the situation where you have an episode that you think, oh, this is just going to go viral and it just tanks? And likewise, have you had an episode that you're kind of going, ah, I guess this will do for today and it just goes crazy? I've had a lot more of the later, the latter ones, but I've had many episodes where I'm like, ah, all right, we'll do this. We'll get out the door. And then I get people saying, oh, this last episode is amazing. I was like, really? The, the, the few times I've gotten like a lot of downloads were when, for whatever reason, it's a, a episode that deals with a particular community. Like I had one that touched on ham radio operators, and that did mm -hmm. real well. And I did one on uh, who was the most dominant athlete of all time. And the answer I came up with was Alan Francis, who was the greatest horseshoe pitcher ever. And he's <laughs> won world championships in five decades. And for whatever reason, I think the, the horseshoe pitching community uh, shared it, and uh, I, there, there was a slight bump for that. But other than that, it's, I think most of the, the vast, vast majority of people that listen are listening because you know, they're, they're curious people. So you've got this great show. What do you attribute your growth to? Because we all know that, you know, hey, whatever, there's 70% of people that find new shows. It's because somebody's telling a friend and you have great what i call dinner party content where if somebody's talking about something like oh you know what? i just heard about this on a podcast there's a there's a lighthouse so your audience can sound smart because they've got the information from you so that's awesome but what do you attribute what other growth strategies are you doing uh paid promotion i do get a lot of word of mouth and people tell me you know they tell all their friends about it and they share it with their families at school and things like that but I also market the hell out of it. And I've spent this year alone well over $10,000 promoting the show. I have purchased ads on every major podcast app that I can find that allows for promotion or ads to be run. I've done ad swaps with large, uh, and the, the larger networks are starting to come to me. So I just did one with uh, Pushkin Media and the Grammar Girl Network. So more and more shows are starting to come to do ad swaps and then also feed drops. And, you know, the conclusion I've come to is that if you want to make podcasting your business and make a living off of this, you have to spend money to promote your show. 
And it's no different than any other business. If you want to have a restaurant and open it up, you're going to need to tell people that your restaurant exists. You're going to have to send out flyers or billboards or put an ad in the paper or whatever it is to let people know that you're there. And podcasting is really no different. One of the things that you know I've always found kind of funny is that a lot of these big networks like Wondery will come out with a limited series of like six episodes for something, right? The story of some murderer or whatever. There's no way an independent podcaster could ever get by with a six episode run of something and hope to, to make it successful because the time it takes to grow an audience is going to require way more than six episodes. But the way they're able to do it is that they advertise the show on their very large other shows that they have in their network. And they're, with that, then they're able to build up an audience, and that's why they're able to make it work. And I think that if, if you're an independent podcaster and you want to grow your show, you're going to have to make an investment in show growth. And that's just the reality of it. And a lot of old-time podcasters that I've talked to, they were able to make their show successful by starting early and just kind of never giving up. And they've, they've grown their show organically over time. <laughs> and that worked quite well. But if you're launching a show in 2022 or 2023, I, I think you have to do that. And it doesn't have to cost a lot of money when you start. But there's so many people that are afraid to spend a dollar. That for, and I've seen this in the world of blogging before I got into podcasting. They want to do everything for free and they want massive success. And I think podcasting is far better than blogging because it's such a straightforward business model where you can spend X number of dollars and get a subscriber that's worth much greater than X number of dollars. And you can just keep churning that and churning that and churning that, growing the show. I've calculated the value of an annual subscriber for me because I have a daily show and you know average CPMs, just looking at advertising, nothing else, is about $14 a year. And I can acquire a new subscriber on places like Overcast, Podcast Attic, and other apps at about $2. Yeah, I'll spend two to make 14 Yeah, why wouldn't you? And I, when I started doing this, I just began doing the math. And I have a degree in, in math and economics. I'm like, why isn't everyone doing this? I, I don't understand this. this make, I mean, it, it does take time. When you make the investment, they add S to run, you convert people, and then you eventually sell ads. But it, it's so clear and straightforward. I just, I don't get why everybody isn't doing it. And the, the mindset that drives people to places like Anchor, where they don't want to spend a dime on hosting. And I, I, I tell people, if, if you're hosting on Anchor and you're unwilling to spend $5 a month on your podcast hosting, you're probably never going to be successful. You have no skin in the game. And you've seen it for years. Pod fade is such a huge problem. And the biggest problem I've seen is they never make their podcast a priority. And one of the things I had to do, not through any uh, you know, decision that I made, uh, I was kind of forced into the, is this position because I lost everything in the pandemic, being in the travel industry, that I was forced to put my all into the show and invest everything I had and, and put an enormous amount of time in it. And so, Pod fading was never a choice for me. I had to do this. And when you have a choice, you have some other job or something else, or this, you know, it's just on the back burner. You probably will pod fade at some point. Funded by sacrifice, basically. Oh, yeah. I, I'm a big believer in funding new startups via poverty. I did that with a business <laughs> in the 90s and it worked really well. I was the lowest paid person in the company until I sold it. And I heard you on another show as, as we're talking about promoting it. You made a point about, I think it was the Avengers. The last Avengers movie, one of the biggest movies of all time in terms of box office. And moreover, it was the second part of a two-part series. So everybody knew it was coming. This was not a, a shock, yet they spent over $200 million in promotion of the movie. And that's not uncommon for you know up to 50% of the budget. Whenever you hear like it costs X number of dollars to make a movie, up to half of that sometimes is the marketing costs associated with it. And if the Avengers has to spend $200 million to promote their film, that would probably be a runaway success if they didn't do it. Why do you think your media property, which is smaller, can get away doing nothing and just making social media posts? And people talk about the discovery problem in podcasting. There's no discoverability problem in podcasting any different than the discoverability problem in movies, music, books, or television shows. Uh, I bet you have a band or an artist that you like 
in music that no one's ever heard of or a movie that you like that's kind of like the sleeper or a book. And people think that, well, if we just have this plat- one platform, then it'll solve all our problems with discoverability. No, it won't. Books have that right now. It's called Amazon. Does not mean that because you're on Amazon, you're, you're going to sell any books. We already have it on Spotify. There are thousands, tens of thousands of artists on Spotify that nobody listens to, even though it's accessible. So having your podcast there means nothing. Music, I mean, if you get a record deal in, you know, in the music industry, what is the point of a record deal? It's not recording anymore. Recording music's trivial. You can do that in your bedroom. <laughs> it's promotion. That's yeah. the real point of it. You know, the same with uh, a movie. You know, we have, we have tools to make movies now. An independent filmmaker could make something quite cheap. cheap. It's distribution that you're really paying for. So podcasting is like any other media property at that point. You have to pay to get in front of people to let them know that your show exists. That's the thing. You pay for promotion. You've got great content that inspires people to tell their friends, and that's how it works. So uh, I just thought that was a great point. You're not on a network, are you? Um, well, I'm on an advertising network. They, right. s- they sell ads, but uh, they haven't really done much in the way of promotion. The vast majority of the promotion I do myself. Yeah. Which is I- exactly like how book deals work. You know, yes. any authors, right? <laughs> You're responsible for most of the marketing in your book. And who do they look for nowadays? They look for people that already have built-in audiences because they know the book is going to sell. One thing I should add about this is if you have a smaller independent show, I've worked with a bunch of people and, and have taught them how to do ad buys. I don't have a course or anything. I'm not a, I'm not a consultant. Uh, and 100% of them so far, after trying this out, has seen enormous increases in their audience by just spending a couple hundred dollars on ads. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars. I think Jordan Arbinger said he spends half a million dollars a year on show promotion. You don't need to do that, but (laughs) you can start out small, see how it works. But a lot of people are afraid to make that initial investment because what if I spend $200 and it doesn't work? And that's a fear. And you just need to kind of bite the bullet. In addition to places like Podcast Addict and Overcast, where you can start for a couple hundred dollars. Those are probably entry point, entry level ways of doing it. BuzzFeed has a new service that lets you run ads on other podcasts. And I did it the first week they launched. It was okay. And then I did it recently. And I bought $200 worth of uh, ads, which was 10,000 impressions. And it was all done within six hours. And it oh. ran on, I think, 60 different shows. So there's far more supply out there than there is right now. So I may even do a bigger ad buy and focus on an even better trailer because the one, the one I have right now is kind of half-assed. So how did you come up with your, your current spot? Uh, I basically just put together uh, the premise behind a lot of the shows. It's like, have you ever wondered why sliced bread is the greatest thing since sliced bread? Have you ever <laughs> wondered, because I did an episode on that, uh, <laughs> where, where that came from. And it just a bunch of these topics. And it's like, have you ever wondered these things? I Go think ahead. that's a good spot because what you do is you get people going, yeah, when did that come from? And that's going to like kind of drive them certain people. That's going to drive them nuts. They're going to want to know, wait, who did put the bump and the bump to bump to bump, you know? And, and so they're going to come over to your show to get the answer. I had a, yeah, I had a suggestion from a listener the other day. He said, uh, we all know what the third Reich was. What was the first and second Reich? <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of questions like that that people are like, why is, why is this how it is? So that, that was basically the premise for the ad. But I think the, the one weakness I have is in audio production. Like I said, I, my show is very simple in terms of how I record it. But if I want to do something a little bit nicer for a 30, 60 second spot, I may get someone to, to help me do that. I'll probably be investing more money into my website. You know, my website was travel focused for the longest time. So I'm at least going to change the front page. I've already made a few changes to make it more podcasting focused to focus on the show. And then I, I haven't done many promotions lately, paid promotions, but I've also been building up a war chest. So I'm going to be able to do some bigger spots, maybe buy fee drops on larger shows on larger networks. So you mentioned Overcast, Pocket Casts. I don't think of the other ones you mentioned. I want to make sure we don't miss any. Uh, oh, there's have you ever uh, tried Spotify. I know has a program. I believe I've, I've the Spotify ads from everything I've heard from people who've tried it are garbage. What I did 
was I found someone that had an enormous audience on Spotify. So Tanner Campbell, if you know who he is, for whatever reason, his philosophy show has a very big audience just on Spotify. So I bought ads on his show and I saw a huge spike in Spotify traffic and I hit, I cracked the top 20 in the Spotify history charts the week I did it. Uh, so I may actually run another ad on his show, but so that was how I advertised on Spotify without advertising on Spotify. On Spotify, the places to look, and and every podcast app is different. Overcast has a dynamic marketplace where prices are set via supply and demand. So you kind of have to look every day. And I just check out the price, and I look to see if history is ever below three hundred dollars, and if it's below three hundred bucks, I'll buy it. Podcast Attic does it slightly different. You buy the entire month, starting at the first of the month, runs through the end of the month. And, um, it's usually a set price doesn't really vary that much. And if you buy it two months in advance, you get a discount. Podbean requires a much larger investment. It's like $1,500. Pocket cast is similar. It's like $1,700. Cast box can perform very well, but you have to spend like two to $5,000 and you have to have a thousand subscribers on cast box before you can do it. But cast box is a, you know, as a third party podcasting app is, is one of the bigger ones and you can grow a pretty sizable audience just on Castbox by doing that player.fm also allows for advertising. And the other thing I've been doing lately that actually works as well is I've been using fountain and fountain lets you do promotions with Satoshi. So I'll put $40 in and then I'll pay. I think I'm doing 125 sats right now that someone can earn by listening to my show. And I've converted quite a few people who are now giving me like 100 sats or more every time they listen. So I run my own lightning node and everything, and and that's coming in. So that's something I'm probably going to be pursuing more in the future as well, too. Have you ever looked into advertising and newsletters? Because I'm starting to see more and more of those pop up with sub stacks and things of that nature. Have you ever looked into that? Yes, I have investigated, I'm, I'm, and I'm probably going to do this in 2023. Homeschool newsletters, not something I thought about when I launched the show, but it turns out there's a sizable market there and a possible market for me to sell other products where I can tie in some of the episodes into modules about ancient history, science, whatever, and use the shows that I've already done to help do that. I'm a member of Mensa and Mensa has a newsletter. So I've inquired with them about buying like a three month run in their newsletter. And I think that would be a good target demographic for me. So yes, I am looking at it, but I'm not looking at podcasting newsletters. I think promoting your show to other podcasters, unless you have a podcasting show like you do, is probably not worth the effort for most people. Well, when I think about it now, after I asked the question, it makes more sense to advertise on a podcast because those people already know how to listen to a podcast. The biggest benefit I've seen of newsletters is that you can get pretty good rates you know, you have to look at how many people get the newsletter and then the, the open rate. And then probably from that, you're going to get a, a 1% look through. But if you know what the value of a subscriber is, and that is an exercise I encourage everybody to go through, because if you don't know that number off the top of your head, it's very difficult to spend money acquiring new subscribers. But once you know what the value is, then you know how much you can spend and still have it pay off for you. So if if I had a, I know there's a one homeschool newsletter that I looked at. They have, I think it was a quarter million people on their list. They have like wow. a 20% open rate or 15% open rate. And then, you know, figure, calculate 1% of that. Then you can figure out whether it's worth your time. And I'll probably pull the tr- trigger on that. Like I said, sometime next year, early next year, uh, as well as possibly doing something with Mensa. And I'm always looking for new opportunities. There's the, one of the things I found, and again, I never thought of this. I started a Facebook group and I had guys telling me I'm a truck driver and I listen to your show and it's like going to truck driver university. So just like I started the completionist club, I started this gimmick called truck driver university. And I've even thought about, well, you know, those like flying J or those, those, you know, big truck stuff. Well, maybe at some point, I don't know if I do this right away, I could do advertising in those places, have a QR code or something, uh, you know, near the truck driver lounge or something like that, you know, maybe that's something might work and you can just attach the QR code to some sort of tracking URL and figure it out because these are people with tons of time on their hands. A lot of them are far smarter than people think, or they're at least curious. And this is a great way for them to spend time. 
So yeah, I'm open to all those sorts of things. And I think especially if you have a very niche podcast, and I don't, targeting the newsletters, the websites of whatever that community is that may already exist is a great way to promote the show. The other idea I had today was uh, there's this pub I go to uh, every Wednesday because there's a lot of professors that go there and I, I like talking to them and they like talking to me. I could get coasters at a bar with a QR code. And because a lot of people have said they enjoy my show because it helps them on trivia night. Bingo. To just buy the coasters for a bar and just spread them around and, and do it that way. So I'm open to all those things. And as my show grows, I've always called it the flywheel approach. When I started, I was in a really tough shape because I, like I said, I literally lost 95% of my income in March of 2020. And it, it took a while. That first month, like I said, I had 6,000 downloads for a daily show. So, so it wasn't a lot. It was like 200 a day. But as I incrementally got a little money coming in, I put all of it into promotion and marketing. And then the show grew. and I had a little more come in. and I put it all into marketing. And I just kept doing that, kind of spinning the wheel faster and faster and faster. And I, I mentioned I probably spent over $10,000 this year in promotion. I expect to double or triple that next year. And I'll probably double and triple that the year after. In, until I get to a point where, you know, I, I really believe the show can be doing 100,000 downloads an episode within three years. But to do that, it's going to require an investment. But I also know that that investment, even if I have to spend, you know, $100,000 over several of the course of several years to do it, I believe that it will come back many fold from that. I heard on one of the shows when I was doing my research, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm not trying to get in your wallet, but you inked a 10 figure deal. Is that correct? Oh, a couple of them at this point. Nice. Well, one of the interesting things about the way I do my show is that because it's so short and because I do episodes on basically everything, that's the name of the show, I've been able to sell full show sponsorships and I've been using my contacts in the tourism industry. So one of my biggest supporters has been the tourist office of Spain, the Spain National Tourism Board, and they love what I do. So they were the first group that came to me because I'd worked with them in the past that said, we want to support the podcast. So I put up a plan for them. And what I did is I would uh, do a burned in ad, not a dynamic ad talking about Spain and all the time, you know, personalized it. I've been to Spain many times. I've been to, you know, I've spent months in Spain talking about the place. And then I would do an episode on something about Spain. They didn't even care. They let me choose whatever I wanted to do. So I've done stuff about Salvador Dali and Picasso. I've done it about Queen Isabella. I've done it about Philip II. I've done it about different places in Spain, uh, Spain the uh, Sagrada Familia, whatever, food in Spain. And they've been pleased as punch. And they actually went to a conference. And when I was speaking, they got up and said, we just want everyone to know, we feel this is the best money we have ever spent on marketing. Nice. And <laughs> a full episode sponsorship sells for way more money than doing a 30 or 60 second ad spot that is yeah. dynamically created and you're selling X number of impressions. So much so that I was on another guy's marketing podcast a few months ago. Then he came back to me in a few weeks and said, well, I work with this client, this tourism board, they want to do something and they're now willing to pay up to $5,000 an episode for a full episode where I just give the backstory talking about some different aspects of their destination, famous people who are from there, you know, famous things about their things that I would be happy to do episodes on anyhow. So it, it was a very easy thing for me to do. And from a tourism standpoint, what it's doing is it's piquing someone's interest. I didn't know about that. Oh, that's how they do that. Oh, you can go see that thing. Uh, I did an episode on the Holy Grail, which I'm sure you've seen the Indiana Jones and heard the stories. You probably didn't know where it's located. It's in the cathedral of Valencia, Spain, and it's there that, that, well, well, they claim it's, that's the Holy Grail, but so yeah, you can actually go and see it and that's where it is. Nice. And now do you have to disclose that? Like at the end, you know, this episode was brought to you by the travel agency of Spain or any, any kind of disclosures? I do it right in the ad spot. So in addition mm -hmm. to the ad, I say this episode sponsored by the national tourist office of Spain and the episodes about Spain. So yeah, I'm absolutely upfront about it. And I think that's one of the beauties of podcasting compared to like blogging or, or social media where people are always trying to sneak in mentions of products. With a podcast, it's all very upfront because people are accustomed to hearing ads 
and they're they're being ads. So yeah, it's, it's really not a problem at all. Is right now your your primary income from ads, or do you have other streams of income? Uh, I get a, a trickling of income. I still get about one hundred and fifty thousand page views a month to my website. So I have some display advertising, uh, and I really I can't tell you about I, podcasting is so much better a business than blogging or social media or being an influencer. And I'm using air quotes here for people listening <laughs> ever was. It's not even funny. And part of it has to do with the fact that it's such a clean business. I am not on someone else's platform. I have all, you know, 180 some thousand uh, Instagram followers. I haven't posted on Instagram in ages. It could all go away tomorrow. They could ban my account for whatever reason. You know, I, I got hacked on Facebook last year and lost control of my fan page for a while. Those things can happen. Uh, but with podcasting, it's so simple. I run ads on my show. That's how I make money. I run, you know, I buy ads on other podcasts to promote myself or on apps. That's how I gain an audience. It's very straightforward. And the math is really easy. I'm so much more comfortable and happy doing this than what I was doing before. It's not even funny. Yeah. It's five years. It's uh, 2027. Somebody's writing a book on podcasting and they say Gary Art was the host of the Everything Everywhere podcast. His show was super successful because how would you finish that sentence? I keep the show interesting. One of the things, you know, when you're doing a scripted show, you're really putting on a performance. And I think that's lost on a lot of people. I've had a lot of people come to me and say, I enjoy your show so much better than other history shows because you sound more enthusiastic. I have a background in competitive speech and debate. And that's something that was drilled into my head from a very young age was how to speak and use voice inflection, vocal inflection uh, to vary your pitch to sound interesting. And a lot of people, when they read a script, they just read it like this and they read it like, and it's very dull. So I think that's one of the things. The fact that I'm choosing interesting topics that people enjoy, that's another one. And the other thing is I'm just, I'm putting in a lot of work. And that's something that the audience understands, that I'm putting out a show like this every day. You know, imagine when you're back in school, if you had an assignment to write a 2,000 word paper, how much yeah. you know, they'd, they'd give you a semester <laughs> to do it. And I'm doing it every single day. And, uh, I, I think the the level of commitment that I've made to the show is appreciated. I've had many listeners who have given me direct messages or sent emails who have suggested I, I podcast less, that I should take a day off more because they don't want me to burn out because they don't want the show to go away. They're they're concerned about me pod fading. It's not a problem. I, I, do, I appreciate their concern that they care enough about the show that they don't want me to burn out. Have you ever thought of, since you write a script, have you ever thought, of turning these scripts into a book? Yes. I have several ideas for monetization down the road that I haven't been able to pursue right now just because of the time commitment of doing a daily show. <laughs> and one of them is bundling the scripts together, editing them, and at, at a minimum, just creating Kindle books. I could create a whole series of, especially the Kindle Direct program, where you just get a cut of proceeds. You know, I could bundle them by month here we're here here's the book of all my scripts from you know november 2022 or i could do it by topic here are all my scripts about the roman empire and put them in some sort of coherent order so absolutely with that i just need help doing it and the other thing is there are very many youtube channels that are nothing more than voiceovers with b-roll footage especially educational channels you've probably even seen some of them or the end. So I already have the voiceover. I have 800 c cases of it, and it would be trivial for me to convert these podcasts, given the nature of the show, into proper YouTube videos with, you know, actual video, not just, I automatically put it up right now, but that really doesn't work very well. But to put it into an actual video, create proper thumbnails, do the proper marketing, and treat YouTube as its own thing. But that too is going to require some help in me hiring someone probably at least on a significant part-time basis to make that happen. Maybe even a full-time basis at launch. Uh, as we wrap things up, advice for new podcasters. If you want this to be your business, treat it like a business, which means invest in marketing, uh, make investments in good artwork, 
I had purchased the artwork for my show two years before the show ever started because I had a different idea for the format of the show. Uh, so I had that ready to go, but I spent $400 on the artwork and it has paid off in spades because people have always commented on the quality of the artwork. You have to put in the time and also think about the business plan. So when I've talked about the value of a subscriber, it's not a coincidence that some of the more successful shows financially, and I'll use Jordan Harbinger's show again, he does three episodes a week. He does two interviews, and then he does an episode on Friday where he answers users' questions, and it's more of a solo show. The single biggest thing you could do if you want to double your podcast revenue is to double your podcast, to just have a second show a week. And a lot of people get started and they assume it has to be an interview show. It doesn't, you don't have to always do interviews. Uh, I think, you know, I, I listen to you to uh, your show all, every week because uh, I'm always up on Sunday night when it comes out and I, <laughs> it, it shows up and sometimes you have an interview, sometimes you don't. And not having an interview usually means that you are going to have to talk about something authoritatively and share your expertise with people, which I think only really helps you. Uh, whereas if it's just interviews all the time, you don't really get a chance for your expertise and authority to really shine. And I've heard, this is another thing I've heard time and time again, when people have added a extra show or they've thrown in some solo shows, those tend to be their most downloaded episodes because people really want, they, they connect with the host of a show and they want to hear more from them. So if you do have an interview show, a lot of people are afraid to do a solo show or to add a second show, I would certainly consider it because I think that part of the revenue equation for a podcast is if you're using advertising as your revenue source is how many ads you run. And that is also going to be a function of how many podcasts you produce. It doesn't have to be a daily show like mine, but even, you know, if you have a weekly show, if you did a second show a week, that can be huge in terms of helping your revenue. But yeah, think like a business. Gary, thank you so much for uh, sharing your insights. I really appreciate it and wish you the best of luck. And uh, I, part of me does want to go, just go take a nap. Just go. You make me tired just thinking about a seven day a week show. You know what I've always found is, is the easiest way to beat pod fade. Mm. Have some sort of success or progress. I think the thing that frustrates people, and I've experienced it myself, is when you plateau. And you don't have any forward progress and you feel like all this is futile and there's no point in going on because you're not growing. If you are growing, it's easy. You have all the motivation you need. Hey, I got more downloads this month than I did last month. The show's grown. Even if you're getting feedback and commentary or whatever, that always helps. And so getting those wins, however you look at it or however you can define it, is, is the thing that's really going to help you continue growing. And if you're, if you're caught in a rut, where you're not growing, change the show, invest some money in marketing, do something to try to get things back on track. And you'll find that motivation to beat Podvade. There you go. Words of wisdom. Very, yeah. very good advice, my friend. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, I love that conversation. I, I think my favorite one, and, and I'm starting to go, yeah, that's true. As podcasting gets more and more popular, we are using the same promotion strategy as the movie business. You make content, you put it in front of an audience, you get their reaction. If it's working, you come up with a budget, you promote your show, and you hope word of mouth then carries you through. Another thing I think that Gary does is he figures out what he's going to say before he presses record. So consequently, not a lot of editing but that's because he spent all of his time on content creation and writing a script. Now, does that mean you have to write a script? No, I'm not using a script right now, but I know what I'm going to say. And I think that's the big difference. Also, if you listen to Gary's show, again, his website is everything-everywhere.com. He has a great presentation because he's reading his script, but it doesn't sound like he's reading it. And he's got just enough energy to kind of sound... It's a, a great mix of authoritarian news guy, but also your travel buddy. It's a great presentation. And that's the other thing that Gary is making sure to use. He's telling stories. We all know how powerful stories are because if you go over to his website again, everything-everywhere.com, you can see these red dots of where he's been. And that man 
Uh, I'm sorry, Johnny Cash. This guy's been everywhere. I mean, seriously, holy cow. He was, again, doing that for 10 years, traveling around. And so he knows that other people can do a podcast about certain places, but only so many people can talk about their experiences when they were there. And that makes him different. So a lot of great insights. Thanks to Gary again for sharing his insights. And I know you might be saying, I don't have a budget for my show. Well, maybe that's one of the things you change in 2023. As he pointed out, you don't have to start off spending a gazillion dollars. And I'll have links to all those different places he mentioned that you can advertise out at schoolofpodcasting.com slash 854. And if you're wondering, hey, Dave, is there going to be a huge sale at the School of Podcasting? The answer is no. I might bump up the schoolofpodcasting.com slash listener. I've done that in the past, and it did not work well. I ended up with people who really didn't want to podcast, and I want to work with people who really want to podcast. I do have a sale if you go to podcastrodeoshow.com slash store. Now, if you're not familiar with the podcast rodeo show, it's where I grab a random podcast and see how long I can hold on. And I have a version of a review called a first impression review. And right now it's name your price. So if you want to pay me, I don't know, five bucks, you can pay me five bucks. I listen to the beginning of your show and then I, it's an honest first impression. What you're hearing me say, you hear me listen to your show the first time uh, together, me and you. And of course, the audience. And I always remind people that even if I go, yeah, this show's not for me, I've had people go, Dave, what are you thinking about? That was a great show. Now, I have other varieties of reviews. You can have a private review, and then you can actually come on the podcast review show. That's a show I do with myself and radio veteran and podcast uh, talent coach, Eric K. Johnson. And so that's all there at podcastrodeoshow.com slash store. And before you go blowing money, on a Black Friday deal for better gear. After listening to Gary, you might think, yeah, maybe I should blow some money on promotion, and that's probably not a bad idea. But before you do that, maybe you should get an honest first impression. So just something to think about. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, my website, schoolofpodcasting.com slash listener. And until next week, take care. God bless. Class is dismissed. All the magic is happening on your website. You've got your newsletter. You've got your whatever it is you're selling. You've got your services. You've got your whatever. Ah, You've got whatever. We got a lot of whatever. Whatever.